Hello and welcome to another lecture for my class, Psychological Testing and Assessment. Uh, this one's going to be a little bit different than the previous lectures and indeed uh, different than the lectures to follow because rather than focusing on individual testing, which is for the most part the type of testing that clinical and counseling psychologists do, we'll be focusing now on group ability testing, as you can see from the title right here. So let's take a look at an overview. Um, I'm going to talk briefly uh, about the natures, the promises, and the pitfalls of group testing, basically the advantages and disadvantages of this whole approach to ability testing. I'm going to talk about a few common group tests of ability. Some of these you might uh, uh, recognize, certainly the Ravens progressive matrices I've talked about briefly before. And then we'll finish up by talking a little bit about multiple uh, aptitude test batteries. And uh, along the way, I'll try and highlight a few important points um, that I think are worth mentioning about all of these types of group tests. So, okay, nature's promises and pitfalls. And an image from Activision's Atari 2600 classic Pitfall the Game, which I'm probably the only person uh, watching uh, this video who's old enough to remember playing in its original form. Anyway, so the nature promises and pitfalls here, we're talking about different types of group tests, ability tests, aptitude tests, achievement tests. And just to clarify here, when I say ability tests, I mean tests which sample a broad range of proficiencies and try to estimate your level of um, intellectual or mental, well, ability. Um, you know, how much you can, at least in principle, learn, acquire, ultimately achieve in the world, or at least in the world of school-related performance. Aptitude tests um, tend to be tests made up of relatively, relatively homogenous items, um, which are designed to test your ability to work in a particular area uh, and perhaps even predict future performance in that area. So whereas ability tests are rather broad and deliberately made up of heterogeneous uh, sets of items, aptitude tests tend to be rather narrow or focal and are concerned with your supposed ability in a particular area, i.e. your aptitude in that area. Finally, achievement tests are um, typically made up of uh, heterogeneous sets of items which sample work or school-related abilities, and they're designed to estimate your current level of ability or attainment. So basically, like, how good are you at doing things which you might commonly encounter in your work or your schooling? Um, and again, they're, they're designed to serve as, as proxies for your school or your work performance. You know, if we want to estimate your school performance, we could sample your grades, we could follow you around uh, during your schedule of classes, we could talk to your teachers, or we could administer an achievement test, which is designed to in some way measure how much you have learned or how much you can perform in these different areas. Now, the point I kind of hinted at earlier um, is, uh, but I'm, I'm going to obviously return to you right now, is that these tests, I'm talking about um, achievement tests, aptitude, I'm sorry, ability tests, aptitude tests, achievement tests, um, there are individual testing format versions of these. You know, so for instance, the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale is an individual um, ability test. You're designed, or it's designed to be administered by one test administrator to one test taker. Um, there are also, as you'll see, group versions of these types of tests. So tests which are designed to be administered to a large number of test takers all at once, like a room full of test takers. And as you can well imagine, or as you can well recollect from your own experiences of taking tests over the years, there are some differences in how individual tests work as compared to how group tests work. So certainly um, group tests tend to have a lot less interpretation by test administrators. Uh, they tend to be based on multiple choice uh, uh, items rather than open-ended items. They tend to be designed for machine scoring rather than examiner scoring. So there's a, a basic difference in how, how they're deployed or how they're administered and also how they're scored up as compared to individual versions of these tests. Um, 
in some ways we could argue that these tests, that is to say group tests, are better suited for screening. They're better able, of course, to be administered to a large number of people. And if you wanted to screen uh, a class of students for those who are particularly gifted or those who are particularly in need of help, you know, if you want to take us all the way back to Binet's original notions of intelligence and intelligence testing, then group format tests obviously make a lot of sense. If you want a more focal and, and probably ultimately more valid assessment of an individual person's mental abilities or their aptitudes or their achievement, then almost certainly an individual test makes a lot more sense. So again, differences in how these tests are administered, differences in what they're good for. Um, Differences in their norms, I mean, gosh, this is maybe a little bit of a speculative point. You can kind of see my question mark there. Um, some of the tests of, uh, of uh, group abilities, group achievement tests, group aptitude tests are developed and standardized with very, very large samples of people because, of course, it's relatively speaking easier to administer them to relatively large samples of people. So arguably the norms are going to be a little bit better than those associated with individual achievement tests, individual ability tests, and so on. Um, I, I want to emphasize that's kind of a speculative point on my part because of the major individual tests of ability aptitude achievement, like the ones I'm teaching in this class, the Wexler system and so on, those tests have pretty, pretty huge uh, standardization samples themselves. So, you know, an interesting comparison that's sometimes made. You occasionally hear people argue that group tests have even better norms. Um, I don't know, possibly, at least in principle, but maybe in practice, not so much. So to you know, kind of bring this point forward a little bit, what are the if we compare these two types of tests, if we think about the advantages and disadvantages of group testing, the advantages certainly could be that um, we can save money, we can gather a lot of data relatively quickly if we administer. Uh, a group format test to a large room full of people rather than administer a whole uh, bunch of individual format tests to each of those people in the room separately. And disadvantages are that you know, arguably our results are going to be a little bit less valid. They may uh, especially tend to underestimate performance for some of our test takers, especially the rather atypical ones, the ones who are thinking in ways that don't get easily captured by multiple choice items or can't easily detect, be detected by sort of routinized or machine scoring approaches. Um, you know, if you really wanted to get a very fine grained and nuanced and maybe ultimately uh, more valid assessment of an individual's ability, then an individual format test probably makes a lot more sense than a group format test. But if you were screening a large number of people, then clearly a group format test uh, makes, the, makes, the, uh, makes the most sense. So advantages and disadvantages, clearly. Important points, just to kind of summarize this little portion of the lecture. Um, who uses group tests? Well, they're less commonly used by clinical psychologists and counseling psychologists. Folks in those fields tend to work with individual format tests when they do their testing and assessment. Um, however, if you're someone who works in a school or educational setting or a vocational setting, it might make sense to administer a very large number of tests to a large group of people, you know, an incoming class of students or a, uh, an incoming group of recruits or uh, applicants to a job. So depending on your profession, you might do different types of tests. Um, now, even if you don't use group format tests, like let's say you're a um, let's say you're a clinical psychologist working in private practice, you're almost certainly going to encounter them at some point. Our society, you know, modern Western society in North America in 2016, we do a lot of tests, and so you'll almost certainly encounter them. And it's important to know how they work. Okay, so just moving along then, in this section of the lecture, I want to talk about some common group tests of ability. First off is the multi-dimensional aptitude battery second edition or the MAB2. Um, I'm putting this under ability testing even though you can see by its title it calls itself an aptitude test. I'll kind of address the, the sort of overlap between what's an ability and what's an aptitude test a little bit later on. The reason I'm focusing on this one now is it's a little bit of an older test um, but it was originally designed as kind of a paper and pencil equivalent of the WACE-R which was an earlier version of the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale. 
a paper and pencil version, meaning you, you could group format, administer it, uh, but designed to have similar types of questions as you would encounter on the then current edition of the WACE, um, but administered in paper and pencil form and uh, graded with a multiple choice format, so relatively easy to grade. Uh, what would it give you? Well, it gave you verbal and performance IQ indices, so again, similar to the whole Wexler approach. Um, verbal uh, broke down into different, uh, or was comprised of different subtests, information, comprehension, arithmetic, similarities, and vocabulary. So again, at this point in the semester, we've already talked about the current version of the WACE, and you can recognize those subtests, at least the names of them, as being similar to those that exist on the current version of the WACE for the verbal subtests. Here are the performance, or we might be tempted to say the nonverbal uh, IQ. This is made up of tests like digit symbols, picture completion, picture arrangement, and object assembly, which are similar to uh, the subtests you find on the current WACE or indeed on previous versions of the WACE. And then combining these, you get a full scale IQ. So, again, very similar to what the WACE, uh, the Wexler system uses. Here's just a, a scored um, sample of what one of these, uh, of the MAB2 report would look like. And you can kind of see here, um, you would administer this and you could use the scoring service and you get something like uh, the following printout um, with raw score, standard scores, um, and uh, corrected scaled scores for each of these different areas uh, printed out as you see. What do we know about this test? Again, it's a bit of an older test now, but in, in terms of its reliability, it was a pretty reliable test. It had good internal uh, consistency, good coefficient alpha uh, for the items within each subtest. So if you looked at the internal consistency of the items on the arithmetic subtest and those on the vocabulary subtest and so on, you found that they were quite consistent. It's not very surprising, I suppose, but, but there it is. Pretty good test retest reliability. If you gave this test and then administered it a few weeks or a few months later, people's scores tended to be highly correlated. That kind of makes sense because we expect people's aptitude or ability to be relatively stable over time. In terms of its validity, it had a similar validity structure to the WACE R, which was, uh, you know, by design, it was supposed to be similar to that. And it had a pretty good concurrent uh, validity with the WACE R. So if you said, does it look structurally like the WACE R? Yeah, kind of, it does. Um, how correlated are people's scores on the WACE R and their scores on the MAB2? Well, it varied subtest to subtest from relatively poor, uh, you know, point in the 0.4 range to quite good in the 0.9 range. Um, and interestingly, uh, not all MAB2 subtests correlated with the WACE R subtest that they were supposed to correlate with. So um, maybe that's not really that interesting or even that surprising. I mean, ability tends to, well, is supposed to suffuse all subtests. But it's just interesting to note that despite its design, there wasn't a perfect one-to-one uh, -one correspondence between the WACE R subtests and the MAB2 subtests. Nonetheless, it was a, you know, kind of a, a creation of its time, a test which was designed to uh, mimic the Wexler uh, adult intelligence scale, but be uh, suitable for group format administration. I honestly haven't checked recently. I'm sure there's some current version of this test that's probably designed to resemble the WACE 4, which is the current version of the Wexler adult intelligence scale, as, as you know. Up next, the cognitive abilities test, or the COGAT. And this is based on an older intelligence test, the Lorgie Thorndike intelligence test. And why would you know about this? Well, you might not know about this, or, or you might, depending on if you can think back to your own uh, school days, or if you have younger siblings or cousins in school. It's fairly widely used in school settings as a test of scholastic abilities, um, and it's co-normed with some achievement tests, which are also fairly widely used in school systems, those being the Iowa test of basic skills and the Iowa test of educational development. So again, if you're in the school system or know people who are, then maybe these names are familiar to you. If not, then they're probably not familiar to you. But just note here that this group format ability test was again designed to resemble an existing theory of intelligence, kind of like we saw with the MAB2, and it was designed to fit within an educational setting or to be used within educational settings, which makes sense because that's generally speaking where you find group ability tests.
What's on the COGAT? Well, it measures school abilities, things like verbal stuff, verbal classification, sentence completion, analogies, quantitative stuff, math-like stuff, number series, equation building. And it also has a nonverbal battery that's designed to be associated, uh, or I'm sorry, to be unrelated, not associated with formal schooling, um, which is thought of as a good way or was designed as a good way to estimate cognitive ability among people who are language disabled and non-English speaking. So again, just to back this up, what's this test look like? Well, it's got um, some fairly traditional looking verbal subtests. You can, they all sum towards a verbal index. It's got some quantitative or some math and numbers like subtests and they sum towards a quantitative uh, you know, uh, index. And that's got this nonverbal battery, which if you were to look at the particular subtest, look an awful lot like matrix tasks. So you're not supposed to need a lot of schooling or a lot of background knowledge to know how to complete these tasks. And thus they may be appropriate to people without a lot of formal schooling or with people who have just different or non-English language formal schooling. So here's some examples of those uh, nonverbal tasks. So here's a series and you just have to pick the element that goes in the series or fits in the series. Which one is it? probably A. I don't have the answers here, but probably we're looking for something that's light blue and is a quadrilateral, which item A being the only one that fits that. Here's a series, or I, I'm sorry, a, 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 a visual analogy. So um, you know, which one goes where the question mark goes? Probably the little rectangle there, because you know, big oval goes to slightly smaller oval, unless my eyes are deceiving me. So big rectangle goes to slightly smaller rectangle. Scaling on that looks a little bit off, but let's imagine that's the right one. And here's one more. This is kind of like a visual spatial uh, nonverbal task. So if you, if you fold this piece over like this, what's the next one that you get? And I'm honestly, let's see, can I do this one? Fold this one over, get that. What's the next one that would be in the series? I'm honestly not sure, and because I'm sort of trying to record this video in a rush, I'm not going to sit here and wonder aloud. You see if you can figure it out. Anyway, what do we know about the COGAT or COGAT? Well, it's pretty reliable. Again, if we look at the internal consistencies of these subtests, they're pretty high. Good test tree test reliability. Not super surprising, but obviously something that the test designers were happy to see because we imagine that ability should be fairly stable over time. Validity. Um, well, how do we think of validity? Well, one way we can think about validity is criterion validity using school grades. And we can ask if this is a test of, of ability, especially abilities that are, are very school related, it ought to be predictive of people's performance in school. And there, you know, the, the, the answer is, well, fairly well, you know, good. It's it, across different subtests and indices, it ranges from rather poor 0.3 to fairly good 0.6. If we think of criterion validity in terms of concurrent uh, validity, how well does it predict performance on other ability tests administered at the same time? Well, there it's pretty good. Correlations are in the 0.6s and 0.7s. Maybe that's not super surprising though, because other tests of ability look a lot like the COGAT. So the fact that you've got different analogy tests or you know different uh, analogies subtests on different uh, tests and they're correlated probably isn't super surprising because a lot of these tests tend to be intercorrelated which again maybe makes sense if we imagine general ability is suffusing a lot of different uh, tests of ability or intelligence. And the last group ability test I want to talk about is the Raven's Progressive Matrices, which I've mentioned before in previous lectures, I think, and uh, you may have encountered or at least heard about in other classes. It's a pretty kind of famous uh, old school um, ability test that could be administered in a group format. Um, it's a little bit different from uh, the ones that preceded it in that it's really just a series of different matrices. And thus, it's really designed to measure this sort of inductive reasoning, this uh, sort of fluid reasoning, fluid intelligence. It's designed to be relatively language and culture free, schooling free, um, and is thought to really uh, get at just little g, your ability to uh, conduct or create the education of correlates, to notice um, inductively relationships that, that you can use to solve the puzzle.
Well, it's I say it's matrices. It's not all one matrix. There are three different kinds. There's a colored progressive matrices uh, set, which is used for children, um, standard progressive matrices, which can be used from children up to adults, and then it's got the advanced progressive matrices, which can be used with people who are adults or people who have superior intellectual ability. So basically really hard matrix problems to solve. And depending on the clinician's needs, you know, he or she could administer, you know, one of these matrix matrix series, or indeed all of them, if if he wanted to or she wanted to. So here's just uh, two examples, uh, which are designed to look like the Ravens items. I'm not sure they're probably not real Ravens matrices items. You can see the top one here. We've got a uh, series, um, or, or rather a matrix, of little figures, and you have to guess the one that goes in the bottom corner. You can probably solve that one fairly easily. It's just a question of addition, right? So if you add across the rows or down the columns, you should be able to solve uh, the bottom being, um, I think it's item number eight would fit in the bottom corner. And if we look at the second matrix, well, let me think it's, well, you can imagine uh, kind of, uh, you know, working across and down uh, you get the sense of which one the answer is supposed to be. I believe it's item number one, but again, I'm working kind of quickly and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. You take a look and you see if you can get it. So what do we know about the Ravens progressive matrices? Well, um, again, in terms of reliability, it's pretty good. If you look at the internal consistency of uh, matrix series, it's pretty good, um, which kind of makes sense because these items, although they get harder as you go along, are all the same. They're all matrix problems, so you, know, you ought to expect that they're fairly internally consistent. And test -free test reliability, again, is pretty good, which makes sense because we imagine ability is fairly stable over time. In terms of the validity, it's interesting to note that when people try to factor analyze uh, performance on uh, the Ravens progressive matrices, you don't just get a one factor solution, at least you usually don't, which is somewhat inconsistent with the idea of the Ravens progressive matrices measuring just little g, just general uh, intellectual ability. Um, there seems to be more than one thing that this test is, is measuring at a structural level. And people have tried to characterize what these different structures are. Um, one solution that's offered commonly is that there's factor one, which is just captures performance on the very difficult items. Uh, factor two, which has something to do with pattern completion. And factor three, which um, captures performance on the relatively easy items. That's just one solution. Um, I'm sure different, if you dug into the literature, you'd find some different solutions. But it's just interesting to note that although the, although the test was really designed to do this one thing that everyone for maybe a hundred years has agreed is really just central to very general, very fluid intelligence, it may not be as simple as, as just that. Uh, other ways of thinking about validity, what about criterion validity? If you look concurrently at its ability to predict performance on other tests of abilities, it depends on the ability test you're looking at, but the, the ranges are between, you know, of correlations go as low as about the 0.3 range to as high as about the 0.6 range. And perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, the correlations between the Ravens and other tests are highest for those other tests. Um, that have a lot of nonverbal subtests, especially, uh, um, you know, things that look like matrix tasks. So does the matrix task on the some other test, like the COGAT, correlate with the uh, matrices on the Ravens progressive matrix? Yeah, it does. And, and higher than do uh, does the Ravens progressive matrices correlate with, like, the vocabulary test on some other test of ability. So unsurprising, I suppose. So some important points here, just to quickly highlight, um, group ability tests are, most of them are designed to resemble individual ability tests, and for the most part they have fairly similar structure and they have fairly good reliability and validity if we want to be really overly general in our descriptions. Uh, the Ravens progressive matrices, matrices is a little bit of an odd man out just because it's rather um, focal and, and homogenous in its whole approach. It's not designed to exactly resemble other existing individual tests of intelligence. Although, of course, you know uh, from uh, from looking at the WACE and you would know from looking at the Stanford-Binet, matrix tasks are a common feature of a lot of 
intelligence test, uh, ability test, whether individual format or group format. And that's because the Ravens has been around forever, or at least for a very long time. And, uh, it, you know, this, this idea of using matrices and series has been a big part of just intelligence testing from almost the get-go. So moving on, let's talk a little bit about multiple aptitude test batteries. I'll just highlight a few of them quickly here, ones that you may have heard about. Uh, again, especially if you think back to maybe your high school years taking tests in the guidance counselor's office. Uh, one is the differential aptitude test, or the DAT, um, which is used commonly in vocational and educational testing and is designed to help student guidance. So maybe it's just me. I went to a public high school in upstate New York, and I do remember kind of my sophomore, junior, senior year of high school you know, being called into the guidance counselor's office and taking quite a few of these different uh, aptitude batteries. Probably one of them was the DAT. Um, and the idea was that the school counselor and the school psychologist would use this information to help students select uh, careers that they'd be good at or sort of um, highlight areas that they needed additional help in and so on and so on. The DAT um, is made up of different tests. Um, these are sort of thought of as being fairly independent of one another. Again, the whole theory or the idea here is that we've got this multiple aptitude test battery. We've got little aptitude areas, so verbal reasoning, number reasoning, abstract reasoning, perceptual speed and accuracy, mechanical reasoning, space relations, spelling, and language usage. Um, whereas on ability tests, there's often this desire to uh, aggregate across these subtests of these different areas and come up with some sort of full-scale measure of ability. Um, aptitude tests often treat these areas as independent aptitudes, like you can be really good in one area, not so good in another, and the whole focus is more like on creating a profile for an individual test taker of his or her areas of strength and weakness, not so much aggregating across all of them and getting one like full-scale IQ or so on. So here are just some examples of items you can see from verbal reasoning, number reasoning, and so on. Mechanical reasoning, a lot of it are these sort of figural um, sort of puzzles, like if you have these levers, which would balance them out, or which how would the, the lever move? Space relations is a lot of folding puzzles, and so on. Again, although these areas are, are or these aptitude areas are quite different, they, all of them are administered in this paper and pencil format with multiple choice response and scoring. Well, what do we do like I, with this? Like I said before, the, the goal is really to generate a profile to suggest strengths and weaknesses for an individual test taker that hopefully predicts uh, school performance, especially if you focus on verbal reasoning and number reasoning, which unsurprisingly are the most related to school performance because so much of what you do in school is verbal reasoning and, and number reasoning. What about the reliability? Well, if you look within these particular uh, aptitude testing areas, the internal consistency is pretty good, um, and that's by design. These areas are designed to be uh, sort of homogenous unto themselves at testing spelling or at testing uh, verbal reasoning or at testing spatial reasoning and so on. So unsurprisingly, or rather by design, they're quite internally consistent. In terms of validity, um, if we think of validity in terms of criterion validity, we ask how predictive are, um, is performance on the DAT of school grades, well, the answer is it's pretty good. It's in the 0.6s to 0.9s in terms of correlations. Um, and that's that's by design, and it's, it's uh, happy, I'm sure, for the test designers that worked out that way, because we hope that these aptitude batteries are predictive of achievement, achievement especially in school. What about the structure? Well, I said before, these uh, these uh, aptitude areas that are tested are thought of as independent. That's kind of a, a principle or a philosophical position that the test takers develop. In reality, they're not very independent. They're highly, well, they're fairly highly correlated with each other, which probably shouldn't really surprise us because, you know, from the get-go in, ter in terms of um, ability testing, whether in an individual format or a group format, there's been this idea that general intelligence suffuses all specific tests. So we ought to find that someone who scores relatively high in one area is likely to score relatively high in other areas, even if that person has, relatively speaking, some strengths and weaknesses. Um, if we think about construct 
uh, uh, validity in terms of construct validity and ask even more specifically how well does this test discriminate uh, between performance or allow us to discriminate performance on other tests here it's there's not a lot of um, there's probably not a lot of evidence that this test is providing particularly good ability to discriminate like someone's verbal ability from their nonverbal ability um, or, or so on and so on. There's probably a better sense that we're getting a bit of a profile of strengths and weaknesses, but an overall assessment of someone's general ability. Okay, moving on. Here's another one which I certainly remember from high school. I'm, I imagine they still give this one out. This is the Armed Services Voca Vocational Aptitude Battery or ASVAB. Um, it's the most widely used aptitude test. It certainly was years ago, and I'm, I'm guessing it still is right now. Um, it was originally, of course, developed for the armed services to screen potential recruits. If you think back to the history lectures, especially the history of testing, uh, I'm sorry, ability testing lectures, you know that in the World War II and post-World War II era, the testing enterprise really fixated on this idea that there are different aptitudes that exist. Um, and that they can be measured and that we can generate profiles for people and those profiles can be used to fit folks to different tasks. Like if you're really good at this particular suite of, a bit of aptitudes, then you're going to be best suited to this particular job. Like this is a very, I think, kind of mid 20th century idea that psychology and industry and the armed services and education had that you know, everyone's got a profile, whether it's a profile of aptitudes on these type of tests, or as we'll see in future lectures, a profile of kind of personality traits and psychopathology features, as we'll see on like the MMPI. Well, it's very, very 1950s, very 1960s. Here are some of those areas uh, that you see on the ASVAB. I won't go through all of them. You can see that some of them are very academic in flavor. Others are more vocational in flavor. Um, and again, this is by design, the test was supposed to measure sort of your, uh, your more traditional school abilities and also your more kind of um, voc ed or shop class abilities that you might have or, or might, be, might be good in, those areas if you're, that you might be good in. Validity, well, um, you know, as we see with other uh, attempts to make multiple, uh, batter, multiple test batteries, um, it isn't the case that the when we look at the structure of these um, tests, the ASVAB in this case, uh, that these tests are really all that independent. Instead, they're really quite correlated. Um, also, historically, there have been some fairly big gender differences, although I, I think, and I certainly hope that most people ascribe those differences to just different patterns of schooling. I mean, you don't need to go that far back in history to find a time when boys in high school went to shop class and girls went to home ec class. So, you know, certainly historically and, and even in contemporary times, um, to the extent that you see gender differences on this test, it, it probably has a lot less to do with some sort of deep reflection on what the nature of the male mind is versus the female mind is, but rather just different patterns and choices and preferences and opportunities in schooling. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> if we think of validity in terms of construct validity and ask how well does this test allow us to discriminate performance um, uh, uh, on other tests of abilities, again, and, and probably kind of unhelpfully, I'll say that the evidence is quite mixed. You know, we don't, um, you know, analyzing profiles on the ASVAB doesn't probably allow us to discriminate people's performance on other tests as well as we might hope, or as indeed as well as the test makers might have hoped. Um, so the validity of this test to be used in the way it was originally intended is probably somewhat uh, qualified, uh, let's say important points and I kind of hit this early in the lecture but as we're getting towards the end of the lecture now I'm going to repeat it. Um, you might be thinking a test of ability, test of aptitude, tests of achievement. I haven't really talked about that so much in this lecture. Uh, these seem to kind of be similar and they are. Um, if we want to think about this in a kind of a very abstract way we might say that ability is like your general capacity to learn or to achieve. You know, how much uh, strength the, uh, the, the muscle of your mind has, let's say. Um, aptitude is your capacity to learn or achieve in a fairly particular area. Like, do you have a particular aptitude in verbal, um, uh, uh, you know, verbal performance or in visual spatial reasoning or so on? An achievement is some sort of measure of what you have, in fact, already learned in 
generally speaking, or in a particular area. Um, you know, how well have you done in your math classes? How much do you know about science? How much do you know about other areas? So ability, aptitude, achievement. In theory, there's some distinction between these three sort of ideas. In practice, maybe not so much. If you look at these tests in terms of even how they're labeled and indeed the types of subtests that comprise them, they often look quite similar. And for the most part, and I've kind of mentioned this in previous lectures, all of them tend to emphasize school-related skills. Whether they're uh, tests of ability or aptitude or achievement, they often are made up of subtests that look a lot like what you do in school. Uh, I jokingly or I suppose somewhat seriously call these tests of schooliness. Uh, and that's not a criticism. It's just a gentle reminder that although we can talk in rather a high level language about someone's aptitude, someone's ability, what we're often measuring in a more kind of practical sense is just what they do in school. And unsurprisingly, people who've had a lot of school or tend to be good at school tend to do well at these tests. And that's not unimportant or, or necessarily a criticism, but again, just a gentle reminder that we have to be kind of clear about what it is we're testing and what maybe it is we're, we're not testing with any of these tests or indeed any psychological tests. So with that kind of uh, little uh, slightly vague coda to this lecture, let's do a quick preview of what's coming next. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about test bias, test fairness, and some of the controversies in ability uh, or intelligence testing. This is uh, another short lecture. Today's lecture or this lecture I've just recorded is you know, one of my shorter ones, which I'm sure you're happy for. I am too. My next lecture also is going to be a little bit of a short one. These, these topics, group ability testing and test bias slash test fairness, are not unimportant. In fact, I think they're arguably very important, but they, they sometimes are a little bit difficult to shoehorn in with the other lectures I do for this class. So I tend to kind of typically put them somewhere between ability and achievement testing in unit two, <laughs> if you're keeping track. Uh, hopefully you'll find this stuff interesting. I do too. But in the meantime, you know, between now and then, uh, as I often say, you know, take a break, have yourself a cup of tea, cup of coffee, relax a little bit. And when you're ready, come back for the next lecture video. And if, of course, if you have questions, post them online or ask them of me in person. I'll do my best to answer. Uh, thanks so much. See you later. Bye-bye.